wouldn't have thought that this album is more pop. I think it's it's just a more mature album. I, I would think it's it's probably sometimes more rocky even than the others. Creativity-wise, I, I, I would say I think we'd all agree that it's, that it's our best. And uh, we're very, very proud of this. And I, I think that there's something in it for everyone. The way the album began was basically, uh, you know, John, our manager, went into the studio and started trying to get stuff that we'd previously worked on tidied up and got, getting that together. And um, then uh, myself and Carlin wrote a song one night, so we said, oh, well, we'll go in and record that. So then it just ended up, we ended up producing it along with um, our guitarist and uh, the guys in the studio, our engineer and um, our programmer and all of us together and our manager. So it just kind of came about chaotically and then we kind of found we were onto something. I mean, there was great magic in the studio because it was Ireland as well as that, because there was a great vibe between all of us. There was no extra pressure. We kind of just, uh, I mean, Sharon writes on her own most of the time now um, and she has written with Jim as well. Um, I generally write with uh, Andrea and Andrea writes with Jim. So we kind of mix it around a bit, um, but I mean, some of us write in our houses and we come into the studio the next day and just literally put the track down and see what, see what happens with it. Recording in Dublin was, was fantastic. Um, we were dedicated, absolutely dedicated. We were able to party, have fun at the weekends, but I think, you know, you have to do both, I think, in order to create a good album. You know, your inspiration has to come from being able to socialise as well. Otherwise, you've no sense of the outside world. I think essentially we're homebirds at heart. And there's, there's something great about going into the studio and when you're finished that night to be able to go home and sleep in your own bed, you know. Mm. There's something wonderful about that. Uh, and there was less pressure in a sense. Um, you know, you've just we love Ireland, so we're very lucky to be able to do it there this time. Yeah. Well, uh, we had always been very, very big fans of uh, Mutt Lang's productions and uh, we got the opportunity to meet with him in London uh, for a party in the park last year when Shania Twain, uh, his wife, was performing. And uh, we just got talking, talking about songwriting and uh, we, we, we got together and started to write, in, and uh, first of all in Switzerland and then back in Dublin. And um, we managed to write three tracks with them, uh, which, which turned out, we think, very, very well, and one of which is going to be the first single, Breathless. He brought um, three tracks to the recording with Andrea. He co-wrote with Andrea. And, um, I mean, it's always amazing to work with a new producer because they are so different, and there are no rules for, for production, I think, at all. Um, he, he is... Um, particularly particular about vocals and uh, he likes to have those completely perfect so you do them again and again and again uh, but he's a lovely guy he's a very kind of I think he's a very spiritual guy and he talks a lot and he, he um, he likes talking to people, he likes getting on with people, he likes getting to know people and understand what, what, what makes them tick so as a guy he's a really really sweet guy and he was great to work with. To go out and to write a song with him was kind of was kind of daunting. I mean, you're sitting, you're on a plane and you're going there and you're wondering, how's it going to happen? And, you know, something I always feel, I always have this worry thing about writing because it's, it's not something that I know how to do in a way as in, it's not, um, it's not a, there's no method in it. It's not a labor. It's not a, a plan. It's purely on inspiration. So every time, Every time I write a song, I'm thrilled it's happened again. But before I go to write a song, I'd be very scared that it's not going to happen. What am I going to do? You know, because I don't know. So <laughs> I have all these thoughts on the plane anyway going to meet him, but he completely alleviated everything. He's a lovely, lovely guy and extremely talented and musical. And basically, we just, uh, when, when I got in, we just sat and he played the guitar and we wrote Breathless first. Go on, go on. Uh, shooting the video Breathless was very interesting, yeah. Um, we, we, we shot it in the Mojave Desert. It's outside Los Angeles. Actually, it's near the Joshua Tree, which I, I think is good. 
And it was stiflingly hot, of course. It's the desert, you know, and so it was a two-day shoot and a very big shoot. Um, the kind of theme was, was Mad Max and Jim's flying a plane and we're flying in a plane to, um, to do our gig and set up our gig and then we've got like guys in Harley Davidson's like watching our gig, our typical audience of course. That was great fun, it was an old DC-3. Uh, it, was, it was built in 1939 I think it was, uh, a Dakota it was called and it was an amazing plane. It's one of these, it sits, it sits at an angle on the runway like that and um, that, that was great fun. I had to pretend, obviously, at the controls, I had to pretend to be flying the plane, sticking my head out and checking that the, the propeller was turning properly. But we did actually get to go up on it, go up in it, and we were up for about a half an hour just flying around the desert. Good fun. And anyway, so it's going well and all, but the heat's pretty unbearable. And the second day of the shoot, both myself and Sharon could, could no longer take it and uh, almost collapsed. I think it was a kind of an, an accumulation of jet lag, being up at 4 o'clock in the morning, start shooting at 5 in the morning and then you're shooting all day in scorching heat, in degrees that you know most people don't experience. Andre was delirious with it, completely delirious. Actually our, manag our manager ended up carrying me into the hospital. I mean the next day we were fine, but so it's, it's, quite, it's quite interesting when we look at it, you know. We decided to work with Mitchell Froome again on this album because it turned out so well on the MTV Unplugged album. Um, he's, he's got a very special touch, a very musical touch that, that we had, that we thought helped to influence our music greatly. And uh, he, was, um, he was certainly able to bring out the best in us. I, I would say that as a producer he would be slightly more organic. He, he came in, he, over, he oversaw the whole thing and uh, well, what more can I say? It just turned out very, very well. Very happy to work with him again. So I step inside, pour a glass of wine. With a full glass and an empty heart, I search for something to occupy my mind. Well, we'd done it unplugged already, and there was kind of very little else you can do with it that way. And it was actually one, one of our, um, our programmer came up with this, came up with, with uh, most of the ideas on, on um, the, the dance version of it, which uh, eventually, and then using um, the guitar as well um, in a different way, it eventually went on the record. But we were very, very unsure about what way that song was gonna go for a very long time. I mean, it was continually moving in different directions. It just seemed to be, I mean, the songs that we wrote suited some of them, especially like Give Me A Reason and also Radio, we wanted to try and do it a different way. And they seemed to very much suit a more, I suppose, um, popular electronic vibe to them. It's actually the fourth version of that song. Mm. That's the fourth version. The first one we did was a little bit more acoustic. The second one was really dance. Do you remember? So yes. Then we, did. Really. then we did the unplugged. We brought it back to an unplugged state, and now we brought it back towards a dance state. So it has a long life. This song. <laughs>
were extremely nervous to do the fla because we we had um, we have we, because we've been in the studio doing the album for so long we hadn't been out in the road we haven't been touring or also we were incorporating into the set some of the songs from the new album which I think is always kind of dangerous people haven't heard them yet and you know like we've heard stories of of I remember some some person in a band I won't say the band says that uh, after getting on stage and playing the new songs from the new album that people didn't know it's not their fault that uh, he walked off to the sound of his own feet <laughs> so that's not good but um, they went down so well the new songs they just loved them and um, we you know we hadn't even had time to run through the set completely fully before the gig and everything but and also we were scared can you still do it because you just mm. don't you know it's been quite a while and then we knew ah that's why we did this last year that's why this <laughs> is good Give me a reason. It started out as a basic track, and uh, I gave it to Andrea, and um, she came up with some great lyrics and a melody line to it. And uh, she came down to Glendalough. We recorded the lead vocal, and then we took it back to uh, this other studio in Dublin, and uh, and completed it. So Sharon wrote the violin part, and uh, yeah, we all chipped in our bit at the end of the day, and uh, came up with that song, and um, it turned out very well. Well, I, the first time I heard it was um, Jim um, just had been working in a small studio on his own, just coming up with some ideas, some tracks, and um, he sent me a tape of a number of tracks, and uh, just to see what I thought of them, and that we were working in another studio on, on some of the stuff that we'd come up with separately, and um, that one really, uh, really stuck out to me among amongst all of the ones that he sent to me. I just thought there was a great vibe to the track. I just love the way it moves. I think it's it's one of those ones where it's a little bit melancholic in the verse, but in the chorus it's uplifting. And I love that kind of um, I suppose duplicity in a song. I, I love I love the way that there's there's two conflicting feelings in a song. I think it makes it much more interesting. I chose to, to dedicate this um, album to our mother, Jean, who unfortunately passed away about um, five months ago. Uh, 
she died of, a, of an incurable lung disease. And um, she, she herself and Daddy were obviously were very, very much a part of um, what we have become and who we are, uh, both musically and personality-wise. Um, and uh, she, she, was our, she was our greatest fan. Yeah, it's a very special album because, because of what we've gone through um, while, while making it. When we started out, I just I thank God we were naive because I think in ways had we known just the sheer amount of work that we were letting ourselves in for, um, I think we would have been so daunted we probably would have walked away from it. But I mean, oh, we had a tremendous amount of enthusiasm and, and ambition, so that, that really worked in our favour. In, in the beginning, it was crazy because when you first get a record deal, a lot of bands before they get a record deal think the record deal is the ultimate thing, but it really is the only the beginning. It is the first stepping stone and it's the smallest stepping stone to get over because from there on in, you literally have to sell your music door to door, country to country. And that, that's the way it works. I mean, we, you know, we, we basically travelled the globe and just worked, 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 worked. This is a special day for all Don't of us. Get over um, here. <laughs> wow. See, they're bullying after 10 years. <laughs> We're thrilled to have you as part of our family, and we'd like to help you celebrate your 10 years together um, by presenting you with this beautiful plaque in recognition of 10 million sales in Europe. Wow. wow. <laughs> that is That's brilliant. Wow. That's That's great. Great. That years, is ten brilliant. Million. 10 years, wow. 10 million. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's just been, it's been absolutely fantastic. You know, I don't know how to describe it otherwise. Um, uh, you know, we had a dream. Our manager had a dream, and I think we've uh, we've exceeded our own expectations of where it would take us. Uh, we've had we've had many many fantastic moments. You know, moments where we were thrown in at the deep end, where we threw ourselves in at the deep end and had to deliver. The only time you start to learn about music, the music industry, is once you get a record deal. And then that's very fast, that things start to move. But I think for us, we always hoped and dreamed uh, in a very strange way of, of um, we always set our sights high. We never thought, oh, we'll just stay here or, we'll, or we won't do that. We, we did everything that we thought would get us somewhere. <laughs> It was definitely a dream, a, a, a quite, quite ridiculous dream that we had and our manager had for us that someday that we'd play Lansdowne Road and we'd set it out just ourselves. So it, it was a, a great, great moment in our career that, that we played Lansdowne Road. It was absolutely terrifying, I've got to say. We, we, uh, we had shot an opening sequence, first of all, that was going to be played on video and pumping out through the speakers just as we're coming onto the stage and the, re the curtains would be down. And so what happens is we came out from the dressing rooms and walked to a certain point and the crowd couldn't see it at that point. And then we had to go up a ramp and we were going to be seen by, I think it was the East Wing and uh, the East Stand. And um, as we came up, some of the crowd saw us and a big roar went up. And with that, it was just the adrenaline. I remember looking at Sharon's face and Sharon was just, <laughs> she was shaking, you know. We were, just the adrenaline was pumping to our systems. And we were scared because we've never played to an audience of, uh, of that amount, uh, on our own, headlining on our own at that stage. And um, w the, um, the video finished, which is of us walking down a long corridor, and um, the curtains went up to the opening of Only When I Sleep, and there we saw the whole audience, and it was just, it was just, it was, for me it was like doing a bungee jump, which I did once before. The adrenaline rush was kind of similar to that. Generally, I don't think we'd be as pet. Well, we would be pet. We would be a bit scared. But I mean, the fact that it was Lansdowne Road and it was home, it was Dublin, 
it was Ireland. That was that was the problem with it. <laughs> so uh, I mean, it was uh, you know we ended up having a brilliant time, but we were a bit nervous beforehand, and it was a great gig. It really was. Fame, fame, I don't think that you ever adjust to that. You know, maybe in the future we'll look back and go, my God, you know, that was big and we were very famous and all. But um, that, is, that, is, that is a very separate being than we are, you know, this famous picture. You know, and I think it has to stay that way so that you can maintain your sanity because it's... it's you know, I don't think you're supposed to be looked at this much. I don't think you're supposed to be, you know, I don't think you're supposed to see yourself this much. I think it can, this kind of stuff can distort your mind. No person is supposed to see themselves as much as this, you know, and hear their own voice and stuff like that. So I think you, you do, you've got to separate yourself. We're very much aware of what, what a business it is. We're very much aware also how lucky we are to be doing what we're doing, to be expressing of ourselves musically, to be working at something that we're talented at. A lot of things have changed and it really is a tremendous relief and a tremendous sense of fulfilment to have achieved as much as we have because I think if we were at this stage and we hadn't moved on that much it would be quite depressing for it to be our 10th anniversary but it's been so successful it, it really is very satisfying. We'll take it as it comes and we hope that it will be success for the States. I mean, there's no guarantees. There are no guarantees in this business and we certainly know that. Um, so we hope that it is, but um, we, we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. I think it's the only way to deal with it, really. Oh, we have definitely fulfilled, fulfilled so many of our ambitions. I mean, I think, you know, as a band, fundamentally, it's not about fame though but fame is incidental and fame is one of the things that happens but to have written these songs something that we've done over all these years that we started 10 years ago you know and to have the world hear them and to get better at writing songs and to feel it feel it better and the music and playing and that it is so becomes so natural you get so used to it and you know that that is a great feeling that is that is we truly have fulfilled that ambition, regardless of what happens. We are living.